Okay, so iterative solvers are a really um, big area of research. Um, it takes a lifetime to deal with iterative solvers. There are people who have dedicated their lives to that. Uh, so we will, I will just give you a, a, a general overview, but you should bear in mind that what we do CFD with iterative solvers because they're cheaper. We're going to show you why they're cheaper and how to kind of understand um, um, the behavior we've, we've seen, okay? Um, so typically, um, systems, linear systems that we deal with um, in CFD, the first linear system you deal with is the elliptic equation for the pressure. And um, in general, elliptic equations arise when you apply a conservation law on a quantity that is proportional to its gradient. So the conf conservation law that tells you that the net flux is equal to zero, uh, to something, but then the flux is proportional to the gradient of a quantity, so therefore you end up with a div k grad p, which is an elliptic equation. And in general, elliptic equations are given with either Dirichlet or Newman boundary conditions. Um, there are many examples of elliptic equations that you're familiar with, steady state conduction, the 2D vortices stream function formulation, pressure projection method, um, steady advection diffusion, you have these, the balance between diffusion and advection, a biharmonic equation, so this is still a form of an elliptic equation. Um, needless to say that uh, elliptic equations and other processes will lead to systems of um, linear equations. Now, when, we, when you did the implicit advection diffusion equation um, in one of your homeworks, you had to solve a linear system of equations. That's another example of where systems of equations arise because when you do an implicit method, you're coupling terms in time, so you have to, you add this implicitness is gonna lead to linear systems. But elliptic equations are generally the easiest way to introduce linear systems of equations. So how do we solve this system? We simply, we simply say phi, so A phi equals B, therefore phi is A inverse B, okay? So, you know, we can do this but we know that's very expensive. If you've taken numerical methods with me or with James or you're doing this current homework, um, it's really expensive to compute A inverse. So therefore, the goal of a linear solver is to do one or more of the following. Either find the inverse of A, however that linear solver is gonna do that, or find an approximation to the inverse of A, or solve the system without explicitly computing the inverse. So what we did with the Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel, we just kind of iterated without ever finding the inverse of A, right? We just kind of iterated through the system. In fact, we're gonna see that we've approximated the inverse of A. Um, and we will typically deal with a bunch of matrices. This is nomenclature that you're familiar with. A dense matrix is one where the majority, vast majority of coefficients are non-zero in the matrix. An upper triangular matrix is one where um, diagonal, main diagonal and all upper diagonals are non-zero. A lower triangular is the opposite of that. A diagonal matrix is one where all the diagonal terms are non-zero. Identity matrix has ones on the diagonal. A banded matrix has um, just a few diagonals. Um, the first upper, first lower, second upper, second lower. So a tri-diagonal or a pentadiagonal system. Um, those are banded matrices, okay? Now, we also deal with sparse linear systems. So what's a sparse system? It's a system of equations that, where the matrix that represents that system of equations is, has mostly zero. So a tridiagonal system of equations is a sparse system of equations because you only have three non-zero diagonals and the rest um, are zero. And these often arise from solving ODEs and PDEs. And the idea of sparse systems is that um, uh, Rather than storing the entire matrix, so if you have a, a grid nx, let's say n cubed, so n points in the x direction, n points in the y, n points in the z, and so you have n cubed points, you're gonna have n cubed squared, a matrix of size n cubed squared, that's very expensive matrix to store, especially at large number of points. So for sparse matrices, the idea is rather than storing the entire matrix, we only store the non-zero coefficients, and we figure out how they're connected to each other. Okay, well, 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 you're not gonna deal with that in class, but if, you, if, you're, using, if you're writing a large CFD code, you're gonna have to deal with that. Um, so it's not a problem for small systems, but for large systems, this is a big deal, okay? So sparse systems, um, uh, they provide us with opportunity to save on storage, okay? And 
Typically, sparse systems are solved by iterative methods. Again, we're going to see, I keep iterating this point, but we're going we're gonna to see mo more of why that is the case, why we prefer to use iterative solvers. And just by way of illustration, this is a problem that we solved in class. A steady state one-dimensional heat transfer in a rod with a fixed temperature on the left, fixed temperature on the right. D2T by dx squared is equal to negative is force term. You do central and space discretization, and you get this tridiagonal matrix. It's a sparse matrix, right, with three um, non-zero um, diagonals. So in practice, you don't build that matrix entirely. You only build the non-zero diagonals, and because this case is so simple, and in most cases, you can you have a formula for what the diagonals look like. You only create those diagonals. So in practice, in Python, we can do um, two things. We can either create a dense matrix from the diagonals, and the way to do this is use a function called diag, um, and diag takes two, uh, two arguments, a vector v that represents the diagonal entries, so the main diagonal is gonna contain minus twos, for example, and a k, an index, which tells you where this vector is gonna be located uh, in the matrix. So the main diagonal, k is equal zero. k is equal one, gives you the first upper diagonal. k minus one gives you the first lower diagonal. k equal two, second upper diagonal. k minus two, second lower diagonal, and so on. So the idea is, okay, we, rather than creating this entire nasty matrix, it's all zeros, okay? Let's just create a vector for the main diagonal, a vector for the upper diagonal, a vector for the lower diagonal, correct these values here, right, because they're not, um, um, so this upper diagonal is all ones except this guy, we set this guy to zero, and then combine the three vectors using diag to make a big matrix. And this is an example. So if you want to build this matrix that has minus three and then minus two and then minus one and then ones and then ones, you could create the um, uh, you could create the the list. So for the main diagonal, it's minus three, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus one. For the upper diagonals, all ones. For the lower diagonals, all ones. And then you add them to each other using diag. So what we did here, we said a the final matrix is diag, lower diagonal minus one, so that's gonna put, take lower LD and put it at the bottom. It's gonna take diag D, which is the main diagonal, and put it on the main diagonal, and diag upper diagonal one, okay? To generalize this, you know, for a n arbitrary number of points in this 1D case, you just set M, and then main diagonal is minus two times ones, Right, so it's all minus two, and then upper diagonal is ones, but n minus one entries, lower diagonal is ones, also n minus one entries, and then you add them to each other, okay? Now don't forget to fix the first and last values on the main diagonal, for example, and you can do this here. So you create d is minus two times ones, and then you say d zero is minus three, and d minus one is equal to one, or minus one, right? Okay, but this creates a dense matrix. So for really large systems, we don't want to do that. That is going to take over your memory. So then you have to use um, a sparse matrix storage um, facility. Yes. Zeros. Yes. Yes. In our, yes. 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 So this operation gives you a dense matrix. Gives you a dense matrix, sure, sure, but it stores it like a dense matrix, yes. It stores it like a dense matrix, okay? So you're wasting all of this storage. For small n is not a problem. So you've seen in our homework for small n, we use A inverse, in fact, because, you know, it's easily invertible. Once you get to large number of points, there's gonna be a problem. So luckily, Python provides um, sparse storage facilities. And the idea is pretty simple. You also create the diagonals you're interested in. So what I'm doing here is an example I did, I, I, I did um, 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 in my office. So you create a main diagonal, so in this case minus twos, and then upper diagonal ones, lower diagonal ones. And then instead of calling diag, you call a module from scipy.sparse.diags. So you're giving the sparse module the diagonals. You're gonna say, I wanna give it D 
main diagonal, upper diagonal, lower diagonal. And I'm going to put those at these locations, 0, 1, minus 1. You can change the order and change the indexing here. It doesn't matter. Okay? But what that does, it stores it as a sparse matrix. So it only stores the non-zero entries. In, in technical details, the way it does it, it stores each entry and it assigns each entry an index in the global matrix. That's how it does. So it starts, it stores another, it stores the diagonals and another array that tells you where your entry is located in the global matrix. Okay? So it's much cheaper. The format, don't don't worry about this, just use you know um, um, row row storage or column storage. It's not a big deal for us. Now, this is easy when you're doing this in 1D. And I'm going to anticipate what we're going to be dealing with in 2D and 3D. And I guess I can finish off at this slide. So in 2D and 3D, um, the process is much more complicated. Because sometimes you kind of know what the diagonals are, but sometimes you kind of want to build those diagonals based on the boundary conditions. So if you remember the pressure Poisson equation, um, on the you, you, uh, at different boundaries, we had different coefficients, right? A east, a west, a north, and a south, depending on the boundary condition. So what I like to do for the Poisson equation is actually create a matrix for each a, a two-dimensional, so in 2D, a two-dimensional grid of each coefficient. So for a east, I'm going to store an, a east an east coefficient at each cell. So remember, the pressure is cell-centered. So we're going to store a coefficient for the east, the east coefficient at each cell, a coefficient for the um, west, north, south, and one for the central. Okay, And then you can create those logically as if you are looping inside a grid. You can say, for example, um, so in general, the east, south, north, west coefficients and the central coefficients for the Poisson equation look like this, 1 over delta x squared and then 1 over delta y squared, right? And then the central coefficient is the sum of all of those. But then what I go ahead and do, I, I set the values at the boundary for each coefficient. So if you have a wall or in human condition, you say the west coefficient on the left wall is 0. So you just go in the array A west, and you set that to 0. The A east coefficient, you set at the right wall, for example, you set that to 0. Okay? We're going to have an example. Um, we're going to do an example in class of how we do this. But this is just to give you a, a sample code of how we're going to build a 2D or 3D sparse matrix. Now, once you do this, now, although A East, A South, and all of these guys are look like 2D arrays or 3D arrays, they're actually, we're actually going to turn them into diagonals in the coefficient matrix. So what we do, the next step is to reshape those 2D arrays into, so flatten them. We flatten them as 1D arrays. And you use reshape into the total number of grid points that you have, OK? Now, the details of this we're going to have to do a, as an example in class. But the point is, once you go from the trick here, the beauty of this is that you treat this logically as if you're looking at a grid. You set the coefficients based on the boundary conditions on the grid. And then you create the diagonals from that. It's much easier, because then you don't have to worry about doing the matrix by hand and thinking what the diagonals are going to be. Because in 2D, you're going to skip every nx or every ny to set a coefficient. And that is going to be a nightmare if you are doing this by um, just programmatically. So it's easier to just create a 2D array, set the correct coefficients, flatten that array. Once you flatten it, it becomes the same problem as before. It's just you have the diagonals now. And then the trick here is to know where you're going to put the diagonals. The main diagonal, I'm going to put it at 0, upper, east, the east and west coefficients, they're going to be upper and lower. But then the north and south coefficients are going to be distance nx and minus nx. Okay? And we're going to get into an example for this. Um, and then with this, I'm going to let you go. Um, but next, uh, next Thursday, we're going to spend more time on um, these iterative methods. We're going to talk about the theory of iterative methods, spectral radii, why Gauss-Seidel is faster than Jacobi, and why um, um, the SOR is sometimes faster and sometimes slower. And we're going to talk about gradient methods, conjugate gradient, Krylov methods, and we'll talk about multigrid. Okay? We're going to do geometric multigrid, um, probably as homework. Okay? Thank you very much.